questions. Hi. Yes. So thank you, Elia. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, some geodesic flows and uh, what we're going to call the even and odd continued fractions. So the goal is going to be to define some map that generates these continued fractions. Um, and to also describe a geodesic flow corresponding to the map and uh, use this to find an invariant measure. And then we're also going to use the surface and the flows to study uh, the maps of the continued fraction expansions. But before I get into what the odd and even continued fractions are, just want to talk a little bit about our standard continued fraction algorithm. So if we have some number greater than 0, we're going to call a naught the largest integer less than x, and we can rewrite x. So now we have a0 plus 1 over r1 for some remainder. Now we can do the same thing for r1. So we have a1 is largest integer less than r1. And now we can have a0 plus 1 over a1 plus some remainder. And we can keep going. And we get this chain of fractions. This is very quickly going to get very difficult to write, so we rewrite this. So we have this bracket notation, and then the integer part is before a semicolon. Um, most of what I'm going to talk about, that integer part is going to be 0, and I'm just going to suppress it so that we can have a better idea of what's going on. So just some facts about the continued fractions themselves. This process terminates if and only if x is rational. Um, there is this tricky issue of uh, we can add and subtract 1. So every irrational number already has a unique continued fraction expansion. If we don't allow this case, we say the last digit has to be greater than 1, then our rationals are also unique. Uh, and then just some arithmetic here. You take the reciprocal. This corresponds to a right shift. So if you have a non-zero integer part, you put a 0 out front. And then the opposite, so if you have a 0, it corresponds to a left shift. So if we have 0, uh, the indexing is slightly off here. So that should be this written again, so 8, 1, 8, 2, 8, 3. Uh, but we can also use a map to generate these and we'll see what happens when we iterate it over and over and over again. So uh, in dynamics, we want to see what happens when you iterate maps over and over again. So this t of x is going to be 1 over x minus the floor of 1 over x. So this is taking the fractional part of 1 over x. This is the same as subtracting k. When x is one over, in 1 over k plus 1, the 1 over k. This is just taking care of dividing by 0. Um, if we look at the continued fraction expansion, we, this corresponds to deleting this first digit. So this is where I'm going to start suppressing this 0. Uh, and so you can view this map as generating the continued fraction expansions by looking at what this k is we subtract off uh, each time. And just so we can see what this map looks like, uh, we'll keep going. Uh, they very quickly get very dense. Uh, but this interval here is going to be where our first digit is 2, and then where our first digit is 3. First digit is, or sorry, this is 1, 2, 3, and so on. Uh, so we want to find an invariant measure. So that's going to be some uh, function where if we take the pre-image of a set and the set, they have the same size. And so for this function, Gauss gives us that this, this is the function we want to plug into. So this 1 over log 2 just means that we're always going to get a number between 0 and 1. Uh, and then notationally, I'm not going to write this as an integral. I'm just going to write the thing that we integrate here. Uh, but the Gauss map itself takes, is an infinity to one map. So we can define an invertible extension here where we have the Gauss map as our first coordinate and then its inverse as our second coordinate. So one branch defined by where x is. Uh, this takes this first digit off of our x and moves it to the first digit of our y. So this corresponds to a, now a shift on the bi-infinite sequence. Uh, and the invariant measure for this is given by uh, 1 over x plus xy plus 1 quantity squared. So that's kind of what's going on in this, this standard case. Um, but there's actually no reason that our numerators need to be 1. 
So we can define the odd continued fractions where our numerators are plus or minus one and our denominators are now odd. Uh, for uniqueness, we do impose this condition. So these consecutive uh, denominator and numerator have to be greater than or equal to two. This is also going to make sure uh, that when we're in the case of 0, 1, that we stay inside 0, 1. And then notationally, now I'm going to use these double brackets, and I'm going to subscript with an O, not a 0. <laughs> uh, I'm never going to have even an odd on the slides at the same time, though. So it's there, but we don't need to keep track of it. And so the way we can do this with a function is if we partition our interval. So this interval here in the regular Gauss map would have already had an odd digit. So we can just leave that alone. This interval is what we need to worry about. So we're going to define a sign for this as negative 1. And then our map here, so when this is 1, this is our regular Gauss map. All, everything is good. And when we would have had an even number, now we have to have this minus 1. And then there'll be a little bit of a shift going on here as well. So this is the map we get out of here. So you can see where we would have had an odd number. We have the same map as before. And now we flipped for where we had even number. Um, and so just how you would read the digits off of this, this corresponds to the digit 1, 1. This is 3 minus 1. This is 3 plus 1, 5 minus 1, et cetera. Um, and then so you can kind of see that this 1 to infinity is where you would have them 1 minus 1, which is why we're getting rid of that case. And again, our map corresponds to just deleting this first digit. So you can also see this as generating our continued fractions. Um, and then before we define the natural extension, we need to define what Rieger called the gr grotesque continued fractions. Uh, this is almost a re-indexing of the odd continued fractions, uh, but we changed this condition a little bit. So before it was that these two had to be greater than or equal to 2, and now we have this. Uh, and that notational difference is this angle bracket. Uh, and so just kind of to reiterate that, that we get minus 1 over 1 is allowed for the odds. 1 over 1 minus z is allowed for the grotesque. So you do get slightly different expansions because of this. Uh, but we're going to use that for our natural extension. We're going to let g be the golden ratio. Dynamics, that we call it g, not beta. Um, and so our first coordinate is still going to be on 0, 1. But now, if you were to go through the grotesque, you actually find it's defined on g minus 2g. So that our second coordinate needs to be a little different. Uh, again, we have our Gauss map in the first coordinate. And if we go back to the actual fraction notation here, I think it's a little clearer to see what's going on. So uh, the first coordinate, again, just deletes this. Um, but over here, we've now moved this sign here to these signs here. So again, in, back in this compact notation, we have this shift map again. We've just moved over where we call 0. Um, and even though I haven't told you how to generate the grotesque, the, this is the inverse of this will generate your grotesque. Um, OK, so what Boca and I have done is defined a group that lets us study this on the upper half plane. So we have s is minus 1 over z plus 1, and t is uh, z plus 2. And you can kind of see, if, so t to the n is going to be z plus 2n. And if you do s to the n, then we have a odd denominator in here. So you can kind of see how composing these is going to give you odd numbers. Um, this is also isomorphic to z3, uh, free product z3. Um, and we can see this quadrilateral here is going to be our fundamental region. And then these two order three generators will rotate about these two points here. And then t will act to shift this. Uh, so what we're going to do is actually consider the quadrilateral that we get after applying uh, s and s squared and then st inverse and st inverse squared to get this full quadrilateral here and consider what tessellation we can get out of that. Um, so that's what that is. We're going to color, let's pop this up here. OK, so we're going to color uh, this uh, checkerboard coloring. So we start with, let's see, here. 
uh, this is white and this is gray, and then we'll continue that on in a checkerboard pattern, and we get, um, with coloring, the fairy tessellation. So this is where we have two rational numbers are connected if this determinant condition is plus or minus one. So. All right, so we need to find a section of this. Um, we're going to consider oriented geodesics on this upper half plane with this tessellation. Uh, either our forward endpoint is going to be between 1 and infinity, and our backward endpoint is between minus g and 2 minus g. Uh, this is partially so that these don't intersect. And then, uh, or we flip that across the imaginary axis. Uh, we're also, I'll pop an example up in a second. We're also going to define these points uh, psi gamma and eta gamma. Uh, psi gamma is where we cross x equals plus or minus 1. And then eta gamma is when continuing along the geodesic, you hit an arc that connects two integers. Uh, so here, you can see what's going on. So we start in this blue interval and go to the red interval. Psi gamma is where we hit x equals 1. And then eta gamma is over here. Um, and this is the arc of the geodesic we're going to be studying. Uh, and then we need to also look at how it interacts with this tessellation. So if we start here and walk along the geodesic, uh, for each of these triangles, it's going to intersect two sides that meet at a vertex. So here, for this triangle, it intersects these two sides, and this is the vertex. Uh, for this triangle, our vertex is up at infinity. And as we walk along the geodesic, we're going to keep track of whether that vertex is on the left or the right, and then also what color it is, uh, and also where psi gamma is. Uh, so these are just some of the options. So uh, let's see. These three are all oriented the same way. This one's oriented the opposite way. Um, and the other way you can kind of think of this is that once you enter a cell, you can go to the left or the right. So these are, yeah, so these are two ways you can get an L. Both of these cells could come in the other color. And these are two ways you can get an R. So here, at the top ones, you kind of have to flip around a little bit to see what's going on. Uh, but here, these are the vert vertices we care about. Here, we're off at infinity. And so the ones that are on the left, we're going to label L. The ones that are on the right, we're going to label R. And then the color is going to match. So questions here. This is where everyone gets confused. OK. Um, OK, so we need to also interpret this. So once we have this thing, we need to know how to interpret it. Um, we only actually have four permissible strings. They basically either start with a light L or a dark R. Um, and then they either have an even number of letters or an odd number of letters. So uh, yeah, so these top two cases are even, odd, odd. The only issue here is that k can be 0. And so part of what this coloring is doing is telling us when to group this as a singleton. So if you get a string that starts with a light r or a dark l, then you know that has to be a singleton set. Um, OK, and so how do we read these? These are going to be read as the digit. So the top two are going to be read as the digit 2k plus 1 minus 1. Um, and that's because if you were to find the closest e odd number, we'd go here, and then we'd have to subtract off. And then here we're fine. We're already rounding down to get an odd number. And then we need to concatenate these so the colors alternate. alternate. So back to the example from before. Um, so here we have an R and then an L, and then we need to keep track of our psi gamma. Between here and here, we have 2k minus 2 L's. And then we get another one here. So that's that light one. And then we have an R before our eta gamma. And so again, fitting with our intuition, this is going to be 2k plus 1, and then subtracting something off. Uh, another example is if I start with this regular continued fraction expansion, series work tells us how to get the string out of it. Or you could draw the picture out and figure it out yourself. Uh, and then we can go through and figure out our grouping. So here, we always end in the opposite letter than we started with. So here, we have this, this light R, so it has to be a singleton, again, with this dark R. 
So we get this span expansion 3 minus 1, which fits with the fact that we're between 2 and 3, and then these digits as well. Um, and to contrast this with what happens with the grotesque, we're going to still start at psi gamma, but we're going to read backwards now. So this gives us our other endpoint. Uh, and so this light R has to be preceded by an even number of L's. And you can't take two, because then you'd have a dark R, uh, which has to have an odd number of L's. And there's not an L there. So you have to be a little bit more careful with the grouping for the grotesque. And that's where the color actually really helps. Uh, so now we get this. So for the, e for the regular continued fractions, the reciprocal just moved would have just changed the semicolon to a comma. This is not true here. Uh, and also, we don't have enough information for this last grouping. So we have a little bit more information for our regular and odd continued fraction expansion than grotesque. But we can check ourselves algebraically that this, this condition holds. So everything really truly is equal. So that's good. But OK, so we can read these strings. Now we need to actually do something, get a map out of this. So we're going to define this action row odd on <laughs> SO by uh, taking, this is actually just 1 over your Gauss map before. And then we have minus, put in a minus y there. Or it's not quite, sorry, it's conjugating by 1 over x. So this is how it acts on these two strings. So actually, when epsilon is positive is when we get orientation reversing. And this matches with when this is done for the regular continued fraction expansion. Uh, case two, we just reflect across the imaginary axis. And to do that, th we have to put a minus sign here. All right, so this gives us a way to go from the upper half plane into this you know, tangent space of our uh, modular surface that respects our ga odd Gauss map. So really, this is just conjugating by 1 over x and minus y uh, up to a sign. So here, epsilon is a sign of uh, x. And then we have to keep track whether we're orientation reversing or not. But other than that, so we're really just conjugating here, but we do have now a way to go from our upper half plane into our odd continued fractions. Uh, okay, so so why do we care about that other than being able to do this geometrically? So the induced measure on the upper half plane is known. This corresponds to just our normal hyperbolic metric. We can now treat this map JO as a change of variables. So uh, if you do that and do a very tiny bit of calculus, uh, you actually get back the same invariant measure that we had before, but our set is slightly larger. So we have to divide by a slightly larger weight. Uh, we can integrate this now to get our invariant measure for our Gauss maps. So here, this is our invariant measure for our odd Gauss map. So now maybe it's, right, this is, we get this piecewise thing, and that's because we're integrating this from g minus 2 to g. And so the, this will follow the calculus. And then again, you actually can get the invariant measure from the grotesque Gauss map without me ever telling you what it is. Um, and as with we, the regulars, we've just integrated from 0 to 1. So we actually get back the same measure with a different weight. So, OK, that, that, throwing some calculus at things that already are a little bit difficult. But the real power of this is now we can talk about some other uh, properties of this map. So we have a geodesic flow, so we can already conclude that this map is ergodic. And so, I mean, here's our technical definition, which is what, if a map is, or if a set is equal to its uh, preimage then the measure has to be 0 or 1. What this means is if you take your map and you iterate it a bunch of times, the points are kind of going to get really w mixed up. Uh, so Rieger had already proved this for the odd and grotesque 
maps, and then Schweiger proved it for the natural extension. Uh, but, so we've, but we've done this without having to go into any ergodic theory. So some other applications is you can connect these purely periodic points. So that's ones uh, like we have just with regular fractions where they're repeating immediately as quadratic thirds with this. So not all quadratic thirds will satisfy this, but ones who uh, one of them is greater than one and the other one is in the set minus g to g minus two. Uh, we get this opposite reading of the digits. Um, we also get that gamma equivalent irrationals, so points that have the same orbit under gamma, are equivalent to tail equivalent odd continued fractions. So that's if you go out far enough on the continued fraction expansion, and they might not be to the same point, that then the expansions agree. Uh, there we go. So we can also classify the closed geodesics using this actual, almost exactly our quadratic thirds, we up to a sign. Uh, and we also can get this formula, which is a little bit complicated, using our rho gammas to find the distance between our psi gamma and eta gamma on our uh, modular surface. There we go. Okay, so there's also no reason that these have to be odd. They could also be even. Uh, so I, not much is going to change here. These parities are now even. I put an E there to tell us that. Uh, we, and we don't need to worry about this condition on the digits. Uh, we do have to mess around a little bit if we want uniqueness because one is an even or is an odd number, and if we wanted to do it with purely uh, even continued fractions, one is no longer a unique representation. So that's an issue. Uh, if you care about uniqueness, you just allow finite expansions to end in one. We're not going to care about uniqueness. But that's just a, a little bit uh, of a difficulty that we get in the evens that is different from the difficulty for the odds. Um, we're going to again partition our unit interval. Um, but now which one is plus or minus is flipped. So now if we would have gotten an even anyway, cool, we're plus. Uh, and if we would have gotten an odd or minus, here we've just switched our parity. And this corresponds to flipping this map. So yeah, every, everything is completely flipped. Uh, again, so this is 2 minus 1. Uh, and actually, the continued fraction expansion of 1 is just an infinite strings of 2 minus 1. And it doesn't matter whether or not you have an integer part is 0 or 2, because 2 minus 1 is 1. So that's where that complication is coming from. And then 2 plus 1, 4 minus 1. So you get actually all of the even integers here, or natural numbers here. Uh, again, our Gauss map is just deleting this first coordinate. We can actually go straight into defining our natural extension now because the analog of the grotesque is purely a re-indexing. Uh, and because of that, now we can just get minus 1 in our numerator. Nothing else has changed, so our set's going to be from minus 1 to 1. Here we've just changed our parity. And again, we take this and we move it over here. Uh, our group is going to change, though, because of this. So now we want to make sure that our denominators are even. So we get rid of that plus one. Uh, there we go. This is actually really nice now, because now our s of z is a reflection. So before we had a subgroup of index 3 in SL2z. Now we have a subgroup of uh, index 2. Right, yes, yeah, you're right. Gamma is index two, uh, and theta is index three because, yeah, right, because we, now we have a reflection. Uh, but the refle reflections are much nicer to work with. They behave really well. And so now we have this whole ideal triangle as our fundamental domain, and we can get the same quadrilaterals before just by applying S of Z, which is a reflection across this arc. 
So that's really nice. Once we apply theta, we're going to get the same fairy tessellation that we had before. Um, and so the theta group has been studied with the even continuing fractions before, but not as, ge not as geodesic flows, as billiard maps. So slightly different with a slightly different fundamental domain. Um, but OK, so back to where we're completely, almost completely analogous to the odds. Our gamma infinities are going to have the same condition. But now we're symmetric about the imaginary axis. So our gamma minus infinities will be in the same set both times. This means that if you actually want to work with them, you need to be very careful about signs. Because your, your set will not tell you <laughs> whether you're supposed to have a minus 1 floating around or not. Um, our size and etas are going to be the exact same as before, so just where we, we cross plus or minus x, and then some arc connecting two integers. Um, we're going to label these as before, but we no longer need coloring. Um, and that does relate to the parity change. The row is no longer going to respect our coloring. Um, and then we flip how we interpret them, so now the ones with an even number of digits are going to be our plus one, and the ones with an odd number of digits are going to be a minus one. There are rules for how to concatenate them, but they're a little bit funky. So I'll just say that there are rules. Um, and we'll go back to our same example. So our gamma infinity is between 2k and 2k minus, uh, plus one. So before we went up and subtracted, now we go down and add. So this is actually the exact same string I showed you before, just without the coloring. And now we interpret it differently. And so before, because it was a minus 1, our row O would have been orientation preserving. But here our row uh, E is going to be orientation reversing. So to get the next string, you would go up here and then start reading. Or you could continue drawing these triangles and figure it out from there. But they get very small very, very fast. Um, so our row E, again, is just going to be the same as we had before. Uh, just switch our parities. And so we can actually use the same change of variables because nothing we did before actually cared what our parity was. So we get the same invariant measure, but our weight has disappeared. And that's because we are no, we are no longer finite, so you can't divide by something and get something between 0 and 1. Um, but we can integrate this. And this is probably going to show a little bit better where that infinity is coming from. So this is our even Gauss maps invariant measure. And this is on 0, 1. So if you just think about this as the area under a curve, this part is shooting off to infinity. And if you were to do it the opposite way and integrate from 0, 1, First, you would just get this, and now it's an area under a curve from minus 1 to 1. And again, we shoot off to infinity. So there's a lot of infinite going on here that is a little bit harder to work with. Uh, and because of that, this is a lot harder to prove directly. So that the, the natural extension of the even gas map is ergodic. Um, but because we used geodesics on a uh, modular surface of finite volume, we know without having to do any infinite ergodic theory, that this is ergodic. And it looks like Schweiger did prove this. And yeah, and his preprints. Um, but we get the same classification, purely periodic, even continued fractions. Same classification of tail equivalent, even continued fractions. Again, we get the same closed geodesics. Um, and you get a similar roof function. Uh, which was also given by Bauer and Lopez. And then we, and also, as before, which I didn't say before, but we can also get the length of these closed geodesics as well, which is kind of combining those other results. So that, yeah, is that really short? <laughs> My watch is dead. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was really short. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Yeah. Questions? So, I have a question actually. Yeah. So, um, 
does it make sense, you know, other than uh, even order, like, uh, to consider some other prime, you know, like five, you know, some other versions of continuous fractions. I mean, I don't know whether it's sort of silly to try to, let's say, take some version of your, like, even continuous fractions where you take things, uh, you know, for AI, which is divisible, let's say, by five and epsilon are allowed to vary between, not between, you know, plus one and minus one, but let's say between zero and four, or something like that. Or well, does it not give you any I think. I'm gonna look at the number here, so. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it sounded to me right. a bit like this is what you were doing, you know, but so, uh, so I don't there know whether one gets any interesting generalizations, you know, th that way, you know, so uh, apart from even, uh, you know, so. I don't know about other primes. So you can change, there's a lot of ways to change what you're doing or maybe one can in the, the bottom. Or you know, to more general subgroups of finite index and uh, Yes. Know, so Right. It may be. Yeah. I, I, uh, I don't know what it would be, but maybe. So the regular continued fractions you can do just with SL2Z. Um, there are ways, I don't know geometrically, there are other ways to kind of change around what you're doing with your denominators. So you can, sh there's this um, alpha shifting. So instead of. Yeah. 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 I mean, maybe. So there, there are other ways where, like, um, with with more with the actual matrix groups that are hiding in here that have been done. Um, so like, you can do this as your set, and then subdivide that in a specific way to give you your digits. Um, Uh, and this is this is actually a generalization of just if you allow all natural numbers as your de as your denominators. Um, so when alpha is a half, that that corresponds to where you're just purely rounding up or down. Somehow that's actually more complicated though uh, than than restricting your parities. Um, I should say that um, even though I was completely ignoring them in this talk, the the analog of the grotesque for the even is not completely analogous to the evens. Uh, it just gives the same expansion, so I was mostly ignoring them. Uh, but Florin and Chris have done a little bit more with those as well. Um, and the grotesque, yeah, so you can get all of this, but because of the way the natural extension is constructed, you can just, it's purely a reversing your arrows. And so of which one's your gamma infinity and which one's your gamma minus one. So it's you get all of those results, but they kind of fall out of the odds. So you don't need to quite study them as closely. Are there questions? Okay. Yes. Yeah, you showed many like similarity between or the expect a similar structure between the even and the odd mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, I mean, the most obvious one is going to be that the evens are in, have this invariant, infinite. Invariant yeah. Uh, for the evens. Yeah. Because of that one over one minus a. Okay. Yeah, the infinite invariant measure is, is definitely the most the most obvious one. So when you're you're working on like the dynamical system side, the evens or sorry, the odds are much easier to work with because of the finite measure, um, and and they're grotesque, although. Joe has said that they are the most accurately named of the continued fractions. So I, at least number theoretically, maybe they're not as good. Um, but from a group theory perspective, that's flipped because we have this reflection. So the evens, anything with group theory, the evens are actually much better to work with uh, than the odds because reflections are better than order three rotations to, to deal with. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much again. Yeah.